Please turn with me in your Bibles then to Luke chapter 2, the Gospel according to Luke chapter 2, verses 14 through 20. As we continue our verse-by-verse -verse study through the Christmas story, reading from the New Authorized Version, God's Holy Word. Luke 2, 14 through 20. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And so it was, when the angels had gone away from them into heaven, that the shepherds said to one another, Let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came with haste, and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. Now when they had seen him, they made wildly known the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all those who heard it marveled at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. Then the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told them. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, this is your most holy word, the word of truth, the word by which we are sanctified as believers. And I pray, dear Holy Father, as we look at the text today, that your spirit of truth would guide us into this truth, engrave it on our minds, hearts, and our wills. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. In the first 20 verses of Luke chapter 2, we've been going through the Christmas story. Verses 1 through 5 is the historic setting, and verses 6 through 7 is the actual birth, and then verses, 14, uh, verses 8 through 20 is the account of the angelic appearance to the shepherds. We announced last week that really this is only the second recorded time in Scripture that the angelic chorus was heard by human ears. The first time was when the heaven was opened up and Isaiah had that vision in Isaiah 6, verse 1 through 8, that was his calling. Whereas in 6.3 it said of those seraphs, those burning ones, those flaming ones that are around the throne, one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. This was a God-given revelatory event that it was of unequaled importance. God's plan of redemption was ordained from all eternity. Now in the fullness of time, as it says in Galatians 4.4, 4, it was being initiated on earth. And you and I ask ourselves the question, what function did these shepherds serve for us in the 21st century? A man by the name of Schweiter says this, Example is not the main thing in influencing others. It's the only thing. So it is, friends, with the shepherds of Bethlehem. They serve as our example. So the question arises, how should we respond to the gospel proclaimed by the angels in the fields of Bethlehem? And how should we respond to the Christ child? Because of all of this revelation, all of the Bible, all of the gospel is fulfilled in Christ. It's all in Christ and it's meant to be revealed to us and to be proclaimed by us. And we look to the shepherds for our example. We are mindful today that what was proclaimed points to Christ, just as all of Scripture does for you and I. All of the promises of God are in Him, yes and amen, to the glory of God through us, as it says in 2 Corinthians 1.20, in Luke 24.27, and beginning in Moses and all the prophets, Jesus expounded to His disciples in all the Scriptures the things concerning Himself. And J.C. Ryle has said, all in the Bible is Christ in all. We must remember to whom the gospel comes. It comes to the humble. It comes to the meek, the outcast, the insignificant. And as we testified last Sunday, no more significant than the shepherds. There was probably nobody that was lower them on the social order in society than the lepers. The shepherds were right down there with the publicans and the harlots and the fishermen, right on the bottom of the social order. In fact, they were regarded by men, many as part of a criminal element. Their testimony was not accepted in a court of law, and they were under a ban of rabbinism because they were regarded as unclean because of their shepherding, which was a 24-7, 365 or 365 uh, a year day, day job during the year. 
in that continual out in the fields that they could not then uh, become, uh, obey the ceremonial laws then to maintain their ritual cleanliness. They were regarded as insignificant. And we think of Jesus, Jesus coming. What does he do? He comes to the insignificant in Bethlehem. Little town of Bethlehem, it says in Micah 5.2, But you, Bethlehem Ephrata, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler of Israel, whose goings forth are from old, even from everlasting. He came to a little band of insignificant shepherds. It underscores 1 Corinthians 1, 25 to 31. The foolishness of God is wiser than men. God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise and the weak things to shame the mighty. Why? That no flesh should glory in his presence. And we marvel at God's ways and his thoughts. Isaiah 55, 8 and 9, God says, My thoughts are not your thoughts and my ways your ways. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my thoughts higher than your thoughts and my ways than your ways. And so Jesus comes today to the humble, the broken, the contrite, the insignificant, the sinful. James 4, 6 says, you humble yourself in the sight of God and he will lift you up. James 4, 10. 4, 6 says, God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Jesus said in Luke 19, 10, I've come to seek and to save that which was lost. And in Luke 5, 31 and 32, the righteous do not need a physician, but those who are sick. I did not come to call those that are righteous but sinners to repentance. We sang already, no ear may hear his coming, but in this world of sin where meek souls will receive him still, the dear Christ enters in. Throughout history, friends, God has chosen to reveal himself and work through shepherds. Have you noticed that throughout the Bible? Abraham was a shepherd, left the Ur of Chaldees, and was a shepherd in the land of Canaan. And you think of Isaac, the well digger, as we learned in Sunday school this morning, was a shepherd. You think of Jacob in all the years that he was uh, shepherding for Laban, his father-in-law. And you think of Moses, when God wanted to call the people out of the land of, uh, land of Egypt. What did he do? He went to the backside of the Midian Desert, and he called Moses. When uh, God wanted a man after his own heart to be his vice regent, his king, he went and chose David the shepherd. And so too with Christ, the Messiah. In Ezekiel 34, the Messiah is likened to the good shepherd. And, uh, and the good shepherd is one who identifies with his people. Jesus gave the good shepherd discourse in John 10, 1 to 21. And in John 1, verse 29, John the Baptist says of Jesus, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Friends, this morning, by God's grace, I want to address these insignificant shepherds in Bethlehem. I want to use them for our example as to how we should respond to the Christ child. And may the spirit of truth guide us into truth as to how we can see ourselves in the shepherds. And remember when we look at this doctrinal truths in this passage, the chief quest of doctrine is to know God. John 17, 3, this is life eternal, Jesus said, they might know thee, the only true God, in Jesus Christ, his son. This whole account is all of God. It begins with God, God's through it all, and it ends with God, and it should point us to God in glorifying and worshiping God. And also with that knowing comes accountability for you and I. James 1, 22, be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. What should be our responsibility, or our response then, to the Christ child? The first point of this morning is verse 14 is we hear. Verse 14 is we hear. The angel said to the shepherds, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth goodwill toward men. Glory to God in the highest is glory in excelsis Deo. That was one of the mottos of the Reformation, along with sola Deo Gloria, to God alone be the glory. Glory to God in the highest. This is what the angels sang. More, we should say more so, chanted. But it's put in poetic form, which, which heightens the glory of it all. The highest glory was ascribed then to God. Glory to God in the highest who dwells in the third heaven. 
But there's also that aspect. It's not just glory to God in the highest, but this is also tremendous news for those on earth. The angels go on to say, and on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. There is a stark contrast here between the peace with God that is offered and that of Pax Romana, peace with Rome. As we cited, when you have peace with Rome and Caesar, there are nations that are subjugated, people that are subjugated. There are people that lose their goods. They lose their lives, many deaths and that, all to secure some peace according to Caesar. Whereas in Jesus comes, there is the peace with God, which is the greatest kind of peace because Caesar can never offer peace of heart. He can never also offer the greatest peace of all, which is peace with God. And we know in Romans 5.1 how that peace comes to us. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace then with God. Peace toward men of goodwill is a better translation. Or as another translation says, peace to the people on whom God is pleased to bless. What this really is, friends, is this is the doctrine of election here. The peace with God is not for all. It's for those who believe. It's for those who put personal faith in Jesus Christ. Those experience peace with God. And if you have peace with God, then what follows is peace of God, which passes all human understanding, peace of conscience, peace within you, peace with others, all sorts of peace flows from peace with God. But that's only possible through saving faith in Jesus Christ. We hear that hearing is only for those who have the ears to hear. And the hearing comes through the Holy Spirit's work, pre-regenerative work in regeneration. Psalm 40, verse 6 says, My ears you have opened. In Revelation 3, 22, Jesus says to the churches, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Those words only fall on those who have their ears opened by the Holy Spirit's pre-regenerative work, and then those who respond, respond in faith as these shepherds did. Friends, have you heard the word? Are you hearing the word? If we have loved ones who have not heard, what do we do? We pray that the Holy Spirit would go before. Open their ears, open their eyes, illumine them to the gospel truths. How sh what should be our response to the Christ child? The first point is we hear in verse 14. The second point is we hasten. Verse 15 and the first part of verse 16. We hasten. So it was when the angels had gone away from them into heaven that the shepherds said to one another, Let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in the manger. They came with haste. So it was when the angels had gone away from them into heaven that the shepherds said, Well, let's continue watching our sheep. Let's bed down for the night. You take the first watch. I'll take the second watch. And then in the morning when we had our good rest, then we'll go into Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass. No. They left immediately. They made haste. Implicit obedience. Implicit obedience. What they are evidencing there is faith in exercise. Directed by the divine authority responding to the divine will. Now think of these shepherds. They were guarding the sheep that was meant for the Passover sacrifice in the temple. This was their livelihood. They resided at Migdalita where the tower was set up along the road from Bethlehem to Jerusalem to guard the sheep. And guarding the sheep was a 24-7, 365 day a year job. To guard the sheep from robbers and animals. And yet what did they do? They immediately left to their sheep in the middle of the night unguarded and went to see these things that God had revealed to them. It reminds me a lot of the Israelites back when they initiated the festivals and God told the Israelites three times during the year, all males 12, year age, 12 years of age and older were to go to Jerusalem to celebrate the feast, the Passover, Pentecost, 
and the Feast of Tabernacles. And Scripture records the whole time that they were gone, when they left their places unguarded, the terror of the Lord would fall on their enemies and all that all around them, so that nothing was harmed, nothing was taken. Same with these shepherds. They responded in implicit faith, and they left their sheep unguarded, and they went to Bethlehem. Also with their haste and their implicit obedience, as Matthew Henry says, those who would make a sure work of it must make a quick work of it when it comes to our obedience. You see, how many times have you and I, when things come up, is that we rationalize things? The shepherds could have said, hey, it's the middle of the night here and all of that. It's dark out here and that. Why are we going to Bethlehem at this time of the night? Let's get a good night's rest so we think clearly in the morning. And then, after we've had our good breakfast and all that, then let's go in and see this thing. And how many times we never get to the point where we go into Bethlehem and see. We've rationalized ourselves right out of obedience. But the shepherds here made a sure work of it. Why? Because they made a, a quick work of it. I think it's a good lesson for us also. So it was when the shepherds had gone away from them into heaven that the shepherds said to one another, let us now go to Bethlehem and see. The word here in the Greek is anarisko. Seeking that results in finding. Seeking that results in finding. Isn't that what scripture says? Jeremiah 29, 13, you shall seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. If you and I respond to the revelation that God gives us and the prompting of the Holy Spirit to the light that he gives, more light will be given to us. So it was with the shepherds. Seeking with the result of finding. A definition of seeking in Scripture is to be actively hungering and thirsting after God's power, presence, and word. That's the kind of seeking that God wants from each one of us, to be actively hungering and thirsting after God's power, presence, and word. We see this thing that has happened. Yes, in verse 15, the shepherd said, let us now go and see this thing that has happened, is what one of the translations I was reading. I'm glad that in the New Authorized Version it says, has come to pass, has come to pass. The foreordained counsel of God in his pre-appointed time is now coming to fruition. It has come to pass which the Lord has made known to us. Notice they attribute this already, everything to the Lord, has made known to us. That's faith and exercise. Faith is already saying what God has said, they're going to go to Bethlehem and they're going to see it just as God said so. And that's exactly what it says at the end of verse 20 at the end of this birth narrative account. Which God has made known to us. This is God's revelation to them. John Owen defines revelation as denoting immediate, informative communication from God, disclosing things which could not otherwise be made known. If the babe was born in Bethlehem, and the shepherds are out in the field, and the angel did not proclaim to them God's word to them, the gospel, where would the shepherds be? The shepherds would still be in the field watching over their flocks by night. It requires God's revelation. And the shepherds here attribute all of this to the Lord. The Lord has made known to us. The Lord, curious, the Lord, the sovereign who is over all things, who controls all things. We hasten the evidence implicit obedience. Their faith and exercise directed by divine authority responding to the divine will. What should be our response to the Christ child? The first point is we hear. The second point is we hasten. And the third point then is we find. At the end of verse 16, they made haste, they found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. Now remember, they had been told that they would be given a sign. The sign in Greek is samion. The samion points away from the physical to the spiritual, from the natural to the supernatural, from the event 
to the one who performs the event. So the sign then, it all goes back to God. Glory to God in the highest. And this shall be a sign to them. They will find the babe wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. Now, this shouldn't be too hard a thing for them. Bethlehem's a small little town. Small little town. Probably only had one in, maybe two. And of course, with the census being taken, they'd be overflowing with people. So there's no use looking in the end. What did he say? A manger. So you look for where the animals are. And you'll find the babe wrapped in the swallowing cloths. In abject humility and poverty. Christ came. He not only took on our human nature. He also took on the clothes of poverty also. Even more evident when he went to the cross and he was naked upon the cross. The humiliation of Christ in taking on real humanity. But this would be the sign to them. They would be confirmed to them that what the angel had said was fact, was truth. And we acknowledge as Christianity, we have a factual religion. It is based on historic facts. And this was what the shepherds then were going to look for, was the babe in the manger, which would be a hollowed out probably piece of limestone, the animals residing in a cave, and they would find the babe there. And as we know, as the account goes, that's exactly what they found. And it cannot be otherwise, can it? What God says, it will be. As he says in Isaiah 55, 11, so shall my word be that goes forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please and prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. God's word is truth, and when he says it, so it will be exactly as he says. They hastened, they believed, they were exercising faith, implicit obedience, they came to the manger, and they found. How many times have you and I then, do we believe, do we hasten to obey what God has said, and then do we find exactly what God has said that we will find? What should be our response to the Christ child? First point is we hear. The second point is we hasten. The third point in imitating the shepherds is we find. And the fourth point is we tell. Verses 17 through 19 is we tell. This will be, or excuse me, verse 17. Now when they had seen him, they made wildly known the saying which was told them concerning the child. Verse 18. And all those who heard it marveled at those things which were told them by the shepherds. Verse 19. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. Verse 17. They had seen him exactly as it was told them by the angels, by God's revelation to them. They saw the Christ child. They made widely known the saying which was told them concerning this child. We acknowledge that they probably spent some time there. They kneeled before the child. They witnessed the child. They worshiped the child. And then from there, what did they do? Their fir first response then was to tell, was to tell. These are the first evangelists of the human babe, the God-man in the manger. First evangelist here of the, of the gospel message. They went and told. Now you can imagine, as it says in verse 18, all those who heard marvel at the things which had told them by the shepherds. You can imagine that probably for days and for months and maybe even years afterwards, people will recount this event, how the shepherds had told them all of these things and the events of that night. But knowing those events, and being amazed at those man events, marveling at those events, does not equal belief in those events or saving faith in those events. How many people hear the word, there's the free offer of the gospel, the general call that goes out without responding to the gospel? I think that's true many times over, not only in the shepherd's day, and in Jesus' public ministry, remember, we've said many times in Jesus' public ministry, during his three and a half year public ministry, he probably encountered over three million people that Jesus ministered to. 
And yet scholars say in terms of his followers, it's probably less than 500 during his earthly ministry out of the over 3 million that he ministered to. So it here with the shepherds, and especially the shepherds, those who were deemed by society that their testimony was not accepted in a court of law, that they were deemed so insignificant and of the criminal element and so low on the society that would people believe what they say and take it as truth? And yet their testimony that was so insignificant to many around them who heard this good news was valued by God. And that we should marvel at also, that God chose to bring this great revelation of the angels to insignificant shepherds out in the Bethlehem fields. So to today, who does Christ bring the gospel message to? Who, does, who do those who evangelize and who do those respond? Isn't it those who are meek? Isn't it those who are humble? Isn't it those who are contrite? Those who have a broken spirit? Those who humble themselves in the hand of God and the sight of God that He may lift them up in saving them. Verse 19. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. Your translation may say that Mary treasured these things. Sinatari. In the Greek, it means here, it indicates she was holding on to the words of the gospel by faith. She was holding on to these words of the gospel by faith. She was cherishing them. She was keeping them close to her breasts. They were precious to her. Think of all that Mary had gone through, all that had been revealed to her in the first and second chapter here of Luke. A teenage gal, probably 13, 14 years of age. And she said in her Magnificat, do unto me as you have spoken. Think of all the things that had transpired in her life. And then think of the shepherds affirming then all of the promises that Mary had received. So that what God had told her is affirmed by the shepherd's testimony in the birth of her child. It says here that she pondered these words, symbolusa in the Greek. It shows that she still had some things that she was thinking about. There were still things that she was thinking about. And she was thinking about these things to the point of she was being puzzled by them. Now, she didn't abandon them. The word in the Greek doesn't mean she abandoned those beliefs. But she was puzzled about them. She was doubting them. She had periods where her belief would be like a roller coaster. There'd be high points and there'd be low points. Isn't that true of our own lives? Some point, sometimes we have great certainty in the belief of the gospel truths. And other times we're kind of wavering. We're wondering. We're puzzled about things. Did you know the word for doubt is aparao in the Greek? A without and parao meaning away. Poros, away. Literally it means to be without a way. It means to be puzzled. You don't know which way to turn. See, you're puzzled at the direction. Mary, throughout her earthly life, was puzzled about these things. Think of Mark chapter 3. Jesus is in his public ministry. He had gone into the temple. He had healed the man with a withered hand. In the synagogue, he healed the man with a withered hand. And he's out and he's ministering to the crowds, the multitudes that come by him. And the report is out with Jesus that he's casting out and he's healing by Beelzebub, as the religious leaders say. And his family is not believers at that time, as it says in John 7, 5. And Mary, the mother, is outside with Jesus' half-brothers and sisters. And they are there to take Jesus away. Out of the crowds. Why? Because it says in Mark 3.21, they deemed he was out of his mind. You see, that is one of the times Mary then would be puzzled about who actually Jesus was. But we know, don't we, that Mary, who treasured these things in her heart and pondered these things, we know that she finished well. Why do we know that? Because of Acts 1.14. After Jesus' ascension, and the apostles, the disciples, those 120 there, they're gathered together in the upper room. And you read Acts 1.14, you read there that who was gathered with them? Mary. 
the mother of Jesus was gathered with them. Her faith came to full fruition in full maturity as to who Jesus was. Now you and I, when we look at this, we must remember there are some people that come to saving faith and belief in things very suddenly and very rapidly. There are other people who come to saving faith and belief in things slowly, very intermittently, and over differing periods of time. So you and I must allow for that. As J.I. Packer said, I give as much of me to as much of God as I know. And that varies a lot. Some person may have been on the walk now with the Lord 40, 50 years. Another person may be just three days, you see. And it varies a lot where they're at in terms of the certainty of their beliefs over a period of time. And Mary is a good example of that, how she vacillated, she was puzzled, she had her periods of certainty and uncertainty, and yet we can say without a shadow of doubt that at the end of it all, in the upper room was Mary, there with the other disciples post Jesus' ascension, that she was a mature believer in Christ, who he was, that he was indeed the Christ, the Messiah. What should be our response to the Christ child? First point is we hear. Second point, we hasten. Third point, we find. The fourth point, we tell. We tell. I think when it comes to evangelism too, remember this, as Matthew Henry said. Those who have been with Christ and found comfort with him should do all they can to bring others to him. Has he done us the honor of making himself known to us? then let us do the honor of making him known to others. The angels proclaimed the gospel message to the shepherds. The shepherds then, what did they do? They then immediately went to find that what the angels said was true, and their first response was to tell others. That is a progression that should be true in our lives also. We come to a realization of the revelation of, what, of God's word, we obey God's word. We test God's word out. We walk in the light of God's word. We tell others as to the truth of God's word. You think of Paul in 2 Timothy 2.2. When he talks to Timothy, he says, The things which you have heard of me from many witnesses, the same commit thou to other men, faithful men, who will be able to teach others also. There's a progression there, and God has chosen you and I to be instruments then, to be evangelists, to proclaim the good news of the gospel, just as the shepherds did. And now the last point. The last point is we worship. Verse 20. Then the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told them. The shepherds returned to their fields. When they were done going to the major, when they were done going around the countryside telling others about all that, then they get back to their sheep. They return glorifying and praising God. As we've said many times, the definition of praising is extolling God's works, extolling his attributes, and giving thanks to God for both. And Psalm 50, 23 says, Whoso offers praise glorifies me. You see, in all of this, this is the greatest manifestation of the attributes of God in all of this. And those attributes of God are not only displayed by God's revelation in the angelic chorus, it's displayed in the manger. That is the Christ. And it's interesting when you go back to verse 10, go back to verse 10. Um, let's see here, I'm looking for the verse where the titles are. Uh, verse 11, verse 11. For there is born to you, notice the personableness again of this, there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior is Christ the Lord. Remember there are the four titles. What child is this? This child then is the son of David. The son of David. Matthew 1.1, 1, 1, the Christ there is called, is in the line of David. The son of Abraham, he's the son of David. He's the royal child. He is God's son in the line of David. It's also there that he is a savior. A savior is a deliverer. Someone who's going to deliver you from destruction, from death. Not only physical deliverance, but spiritual deliverance. There is also, he's the Christ. That's the Greek. 
That's a title for Jesus. It's, over time, it became part of his name, but it's a title for Jesus. That's the Greek. He's the anointed one. In the Hebrew, it's Messiah. And you know in the Old Testament, the anointed one was ordained by God, set apart by God, anointed with oil for a particular task to which he'd been consecrated to. And in the Old Testament, the kings, the priests, the prophets were the anointed one. Jesus comes in the New Testament, 1 Timothy 2.5. There's one God and one mediator between man and God, the man Christ Jesus. Jesus as a mediator fulfills that threefold office, prophet, priest, and king. To deliver us from the bondage of sin, from the guilt of sin, and from then the pres ultimately from the presence of sin in the realm of sin. He then is also the Lord. The Lord means that he's the sovereign one. He's controlling over all things. He is very God. This is the first time now where you have Christ and Lord put together. So what he's saying here, Luke is saying, is the one in the manger is Christ the Lord. He is very God and very human. Very God and very human. He is God himself who's in the manger. So there's glorifying and praising God for all the things that the shepherds had heard and seen as it was told them. It came to pass just as God had said to them. And what was their response in it all? What you witnessed then in the manger prompted us the worship of the Christ child in the manger. And in that is not that should be the same for you and I when we look at the Christmas story. These events are so familiar to us, the story is familiar to us. How do we look at that? Is it a whole hum to us? Do we glance over it? Or do we pause and meditate on those truths? What it means to us as believers that there is a Christ child in a manger. And as we witness that and as we understand that, what should be our response? Glorifying and praising God in the highest and for his peace that he has given us through Christ, the Prince of Peace, as it says in Isaiah 9, 6. Worship. They were experiencing great joy. And what did the shepherds say to them? Do not be afraid. I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be all the people in verse 10. Isn't that exactly what they are experiencing Great joy, complete satisfaction, mind, heart, emotions, and desires. That's what the joy is that you and I should experience. And we know from John 17, 13, and John 15, 11, the joy is of Christ. It originates with Him. That is what is put within us. His strength is put within us. The joy of the Lord is our strength, Nehemiah 10. The rejoicing that is there, Philippians 4, 4, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. And that complete satisfaction, mind, heart, emotion, and desire that Christ puts in us, irregardless of circumstances around us. That joy of Christ is ours, the great joy. And all of the truths that they were aware of, they received Christ by faith, they acted in faith and obedience, and in terms of their evangelizing the truth in that, overriding it all was their worship of the Christ child in the manger. I pray that's true of us also this Christmas season. What should be our response to the Christ child? Five points this morning. Imitating the shepherds, we hear, we hasten, we find, we tell, and we worship. The story is told of D.L. Moody and Ira Sankey as they rode a train to Edinburgh, Scotland. They were on this train, and it was during their ministry in the British Isles in 1873, Sankey picked up a newspaper and he found a poem about the prodigal son that interested him. So he clipped it out and saved it. After the noon meeting a day or two later, Moody spoke on the good shepherd, John 10 and 11. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep, for sinful prodigals. And Moody asked Sankey for an appropriate song and all Sank Sankey could think of was that poem. So Sankey took that poem that he clipped out of that newspaper, put it on his organ before him. He prayed silently and he began to sing. Note by note, the tune was given to him. Sankey wrote years later. And as he, that song was sung at one of uh, 
Moody's meetings, the singing ceased and a great sigh went up. Sankey said, I knew that the song had reached the hearts of the Scottish audience, and that song was the 90 and 9. And the last verse, friends, says this. All through the mountains thunder riven, and up from the rocky steep, there arose a glad cry to the gate of heaven. Rejoice, I have found my sheep. And the angels echoed around the throne. Rejoice, the Lord brings back his own. Rejoice, the Lord brings back his own. Friends, isn't that the essence of the Christmas story for you and I? Between the angels, between the shepherds, and as you and I identify with the shepherds, unless the good shepherd first humbles himself and he takes on human flesh, there is no bringing back of his own, is there? So that one day, one day, that child in the manger would go to Calvary's tree and he'd die for the sins of his people to redeem them to God. In the angelic rejoicing in the fields, and the shepherds rejoicing around the manger, in the angelic rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents, is all inseparably connected together to our being saved by faith in Christ and being his called people. Formerly, we were lost sheep. We were prodigal sons and daughters, lost in sin and headed for hell. And now, by Christ's initiative and his Holy Spirit, we've been found. We're redeemed sheep. Oh, the grace that brought it down to man. Oh, the grace that spawns salvation's plan. Oh, the mighty gulf that God did span at Bethlehem and eventually at Calvary. Friends, is that central part of your Christmas joy this season? If not, you've missed the reason for the season, Jesus Christ, and you are to be most pitied. For us who are truly saved and know the profound meaning of saving grace, there's no greater joy than to identify with the lowly shepherds of Bethlehem, to bow down and worship the Christ child in the manger, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the Son of David, the Savior, the Christ, the Lord, Adonai, King of kings and Lord of lords. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your word of truth. I pray, Dear Heavenly Father, these words, though familiar, may truly resonate in our heart of hearts today by your Holy